GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that on-chain social media is going to change the world. That's why I'm carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode. Today, we have joining us Ash Gammy from DSO to talk all about on-chain social media, Web3 social media, decentralized social media, whatever you want to call it. We've talked a lot about this on the show throughout the past you know, few years. We've talked about Lens, we've talked about Farcaster, and DSO is the other big player in this space that is really focused on bringing our content on-chain. This episode is amazing because Ash talks about why we need on-chain social media, which I think we all get, but he points it out and frames it in a way that I haven't heard before that I think is really helpful. He also talks about why DSO decided to build their own layer one blockchain. This is a really interesting conversation. When you're building in Web3, one of the first questions is what chain do we build on? And when DSO launched, there was the only choice at that time was Ethereum for a well-networked, programmable, smart contract blockchain, which is what social needed. And Ethereum was not right, quite frankly, for social. So DSO decided to build their own layer one. And I directly ask, asked the question, would you consider moving to an L2? And he talks about why they wouldn't move to an L2, which is very interesting because Lens and Farcaster are both on L2s. So we see how there's different ways to build in order to achieve the same objective. We also talk in this episode about what are the top apps that are being used on DSO and in decentralized social right now. There's obviously, we're not going to start to use decentralized social. We're not going to move off Twitter. We're not going to move off Instagram until there is apps that allow us to do things that we can't do in web two. And we talk about what those apps are and what they do. And there's some great examples of real use apps that are happening over on DSO right now. The last thing we talked about in this episode, which was super cool, is what's next for DSO? DSO right now is moving from a proof of work to a proof of stake blockchain. And Ash breaks down how once they move to proof of stake, they are looking at creating a new reward system, basically, using proof of stake, where if you stake your DSO, and then you also go and use the social side, so you post, then you can gain yield. Well, isn't that an interesting retention mechanism that any business should be thinking about? It totally opened up my mind to proof of stake not just being a tool for yield for DeFi and for tokens, but proof of stake, or I should say staking a token actually being something that any builder could build in order to create more retention and to reward users in a new way. Very, very cool. Very enlightening. And then finally, we break down block explorers and why block explorers are going to solve a lot of the problems with Web2 Social. This episode must listen. Social media is a part of all of our lives and moving it on chain is the future. So you want to make sure you understand how that's going to happen and how that's going to work. This episode is going to be a great one. Get ready. Buckle up, everybody. First, let's just hear a word from our sponsor. Modern newsletters are built on Paragraph. That's right. Paragraph is a brand new newsletter platform that combines the best parts of Web2 and Web3 to supercharge newsletters for both writers and readers. Build a community, not just an audience. Paragraph uses blockchain tech to allow readers to collect and own the words that matter to them. This takes reading a newsletter to the next level. With Paragraph, readers can mint, collect, and show off quotes from their favorite newsletters. This opens new possibilities like creators sharing revenue with fans. I also love their new feature, Paragraph AI. This integrates GPT-4 natively in Paragraph to create, edit, and improve your writing effortlessly with one click. And guess what? We at Web3 Academy are on board and have already moved our content over to Paragraph. We believe this is the future of newsletters because of the profound engagement it creates between creators and fans. So 
Whether you're a creator, writer, or an avid reader, it's time to check out Paragraph and capitalize on the opportunity of being early. GM, Ash, welcome to Web3 Academy. What's up, Jay? Thanks for having me. Man, I am excited for this conversation for many reasons. One, always excited to have a guy with a smile like you on the show. You bring <laughs> the energy, and I love that. But also really excited to talk about on-chain social. We've talked lots about Lens, Farcaster, and DSO over the past two years of this show. And you're the first person from DSO that we've had on to really break down what you guys are building in on-chain social. So let's let's start sort of zoom out. What's the vision for DSO? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jay. So our mission is to decentralize social media the same way that Bitcoin and Ethereum are decentralizing finance. So completely open social network, open the world's information. Mm -hmm. And we thought the best way to do that was to create a custom built layer one blockchain designed specifically for decentralized social media applications. That's what the founder, Nader Al-Naji, Al that's his mission. And um, the reason he kind of decided to build custom was because at the time, really, I mean, I think it's still kind of a problem too, is a lot of layer ones were built for financial applications, which is we call finite state blockchains. You only need a certain type or amount of data for financial applications. You need the starting balance and the en ending balance. What Natter has built is uh, infinite state blockchain because with a social network, the state is always changing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you need different storage and data capabilities to scale social network. So that's essentially why he built DSO custom versus trying to build on Ethereum or some other layer one. Very interesting. I, yeah. I want to dive more into that decision in a second. But before we do, you brought up that the mission is decentralized social. And we all interact on social media every day. Quite frankly, it's like really one of the best things that the internet gave us, right? Like the online world gave us this ability to connect with our family, our parents, our friends, and strangers all around the world. Now, up until now, that has been done in a centralized way. I think that I just want people to understand why do we need decentralized social? Like we already have great social media. We already have this ability to connect. What is it about on-chain social or decentralized social that's different and solves some problems that we have with the current model? Yeah, that's a really, really good and big question. I think there are new examples to why we need it every single day, but some of the ones you want to start with are content ownership, social graph ownership, new monetization opportunities, mm -hmm. basically an innovation in social media. Some of the dark stuff we'll talk about, like manipulative algorithms and dark mm -hmm. pattern stuff we'll talk about. But the main ones are what I just listed right now. So we don't know what we're missing, Jay. Basically, imagine you're in a world where the only three restaurants are McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's. And that's all you ate day in and day out. You went to the store and your baby formula was made out of mayonnaise, you know, <laughs> or something like that or McDonald's baby formula. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine all the sorts of problems that that would bring, you know, and that's the world we live in. Basically, we have lived in for the last 20 years for social media. And we don't own any of our content or anything, and they monetize and monopolize our data. And I don't think people really appreciate like how much they take from us data wise and how much they make off of it. Like we spend a lot of time, like you said, they've monopolized our day to day social interactions mm -hmm. completely digitally. And in, in return, we get the opportunity to maybe go viral one day we don't make any money off of it up front. That's really why we need to decentralize it. Then going to the dark parts of it, the manipulative algorithms. I have this coloring book. I don't know if I'll, I'll show it. It's called uh, The Coloring Book of Social Manipulation. Okay. Uh, okay. Looks like, and, a, for those listening, it looks like a giant textbook. Yeah. Okay. It's a coloring book of like graphs and you, charts. It looks very nerdy. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh, 
typical nerd stuff, but it's like, it shows all the UIs, the user interfaces of like what they build to kind of like manipulate the masses to do certain things a certain way, serve an underlying agenda. I, I think we've seen a lot of that happen over the last four years. And now it's proven that there's government collusion and in, in social media. And we're mostly unaware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they've spent the last 20 years with these well-funded user experience teams, understanding how we think and creating, you know, addictive patterns to get us to act a certain way. And we've seen this story play out in our favorite movies, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. Absolute power always corrupts, right? We've seen it in finance. Bitcoin came around, started leveling the playing field. We've, now we're seeing it in social media. So decentralizing that, we, we basically have to decentralize that power to unlock innovation and unlock mm -hmm. new use cases so the masses can have a little bit better of an opportunity to monetize and, and own their content like they own their Bitcoin and, and their houses and gold and stuff like that. Yeah. So. yeah just to name a few, hey, like you answer that question so well of why we need on-chain social, decentralized social. And you could pick one of those topics and have that alone be the reason. But there's so, so many reasons. And one thing I think, I think everybody understands the the content ownership or is starting to understand that more because they're used to their data being sold for ads. And everybody knows the feeling of, I just said to my wife that I wanted a new pair of shoes and then Nike gives me a new pair of shoes on my and I'm not suggesting our phones are listening to you. The algorithms are right. just that freaking good with your data, right? Um, so everyone knows that. But I think that the uh, we don't think a lot about the dark side, you know, because I think a lot of us are like, whoa, 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 take your you know tinfoil hat off, come on, man. But it's like, no, this is really happening. There is like yeah. a manipulation happening behind the scenes at the government level, at the corporate level, in ways that, quite frankly, are not none of us would agree to, right? right? But I think the the thing that I get the most excited about is the innovation side. And we're going to get into that later in the show when we talk about what you guys are planning in the future and some of the upcoming apps or the apps that you're most excited about that are being built on DSO. And that is the thing I think I get, the power of composability and interoperability. Like I can't express enough that like if you're in Web3 or in crypto or if just you're a business person and you want to understand like, innovation that scales at an incredible rate, just wrap your head around those two concepts. And you'll see that when you have a platform like DSO, where you're building this chain, then you can enable innovation across so many different businesses because they can all come in and they can composably build something on top of what you're already building. It's a lightning ball that's going to lead to exponential growth in ways that we never really understood before. I mean, it kind of goes back to when Twitter did have an open API and there were people building on top of Twitter and there was cool stuff happening. Yeah. And then Twitter rugged us all and took the API away. Exactly. They all did that way. Absolutely fine. Yeah. A hundred percent. Okay. I want to go back to what you were saying about your choice to build an L, your own layer one, rather than what Lens and Farcaster are doing. Lens is built on top of Polygon. They're building their own layer three, Momoka, and then Farcaster. I don't think they're on Optimism yet, but I know they're moving over to the OP stack. So we have two examples of other social players that are using L2s and What's interesting, I think, about DSO is, like you said, you guys chose to build your own L1. And you you mentioned that definitely one of the, the reasons for that is that like L1s like Ethereum are not made for social usage, social apps. So there's way too much data. If social was built on ETH, I don't even know how it would cost us like you know, probably five bucks just to like make a post or something like that, right? It would be ridiculous. Yeah. We did a an analysis, just to give you an, a different example, we did an analysis of FriendTech recently and FriendTech to date has, the cost to users to use FriendTech has been around $750,000 in total gas, all right? And that's for about 150,000 users over the course of the last month and about 
150 million in volume that's happened. So like that's scalable. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's pretty, whereas had Frentech been built on Ethereum, that cost would have been over $20 million. Yeah. Like it just wouldn't be possible, right? So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about if you could go back, like, do you think, and I know it's not you, Nader, do you think that like yeah. the team, would they consider building an L2? Because I know that there's some other elements to why you guys built your own chain at, that were sort of key to the foundational beliefs of building DSO. Yeah, definitely. And just going back to cost, I think what's that MevBot or whatever, Jared from Subway spent like yeah. spent 70 million in gas or something. <laughs> And Ethereum and all these chains have their place. Like, obviously, you can't deny the disruptiveness of Ethereum and the success of Ethereum. But I think we like to think of ourselves as UX maxis. I think that comes from Natter, especially. And the thing is, like, if you're building on all these different chains, one, like you mentioned, we've covered cost enough, but there's a lot of context switching. It's money Legos, as they call them. Mm -hmm. So you have, I mean, there's like, 300 different wallets on Ethereum, you know, and then you have to like, it creates additional friction points. You have to log in with one wallet, it's got to connect, and then you got to sign this transaction, and then you got to pay this fee, and and then you get to like, hey, I got to bridge over to this layer two, and then it's going to take seven days to bridge back, and just a UX disaster. <laughs> well, we're all trying to, you know, everybody says UX is the key to mass adoption. We're creating more steps. We're creating more context switching. And if you're a big UX person, you understand it's the small positive UX changes over time that compound that lead to, you know, people. There's this book, UX book. It's very famous. Stephen Krug, I believe. It's called Don't Make Me Think. That's like the fundamental number one in UX. Don't make me think. If I have to think that I'm going to lose my money bridging over and I also have to think about the gas fees to and from. You failed as a UX. That's why Natter built his own custom layer one is because it's faster, cheaper, better UX, no context switching. And you can kind of like everything comes out of the box with DSO. It's like reputation, identity. The wallet is built on chain, right? It's everything stored on chain on DSO. And it goes back to the storage stuff in the finite state blockchain versus infinite state. Everything on, on DSO is stored on chain. I mean, besides like the videos and stuff, which we're going to solve that with decentralized storage. We'll have our own. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about So can anybody later. who yeah. judges you for not, for like not being able to store videos on chain yet can just chill out? Like we'll get there. People. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously we have to work towards some stuff and I get that approach yeah. with like Ethereum and other layer ones, like you build it and then you build towards something better. Right. But you know, Again, it's all about UX, creating a smooth user experience across the entire ecosystem. And when you do use our apps, it a lot of it feels very instant. And our first prototype app was when like the VCs and the investors and people who would post on BitCloud, basically, everybody said it felt instant. It felt like Twitter. You know, you'd po post something versus on another blockchain, you would have to sign a transaction and it would create more friction and stuff like that. So... It's such a good point. It's yeah. we will literally never achieve mass adoption if you have to sign a transaction every time you want right. to interact with the chain. It will not work, which is why account abstraction is such a big topic right now. Yeah. And we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. That's another right. podcast for another time. But I think everybody understands that that need and the way you guys are solving that is by having your own layer one. And then, as you said, everything's built from the foundation up and it's much easier to use it as opposed to having to deal with all this bridging and cross chain. It's, I mean, yeah, it's a UX nightmare. So I totally respect the way you guys went after that. Okay. Let's just take a pause and give everybody, for those who don't know DSO well, maybe some of our listeners haven't had experience using DSO. Can you give us sort of the high level numbers, where are you guys at, how many people are in the ecosystem? Yeah. So DSO has like 2.5 million wallets on chain that have signed up so far. On any given day, we've had anywhere from 
500 to 10,000 daily active users. Right now, it's pretty low. I think it's around like a thousand or two thousand. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, don't worry. That's that's yeah. the truth for everybody, right? Uh, it gets to like five hundred to seven hundred and stuff like that. I think that's crypto right now. Um, yeah. And there's been eighty million transactions. And just for some context, like there's way more transactions on DSO versus Ethereum. So it's like every like, post, follow, repost minting nfts and stuff like that that counts as a transaction so mm-hmm. there's a d- decent amount of activity on the chain um mm-hmm. because of that and DSO raised uh 200 million during the bull market as well from our wow. first prototype app yeah so wow yeah. so you guys have done an incredible job so far and i think you have a very similar story to a lot of builders in this space, which is built in the bowl. Everybody was super excited, got a big raise, although you guys got a really, really big raise. Yeah. And then the bear hit and now it's like, okay, let's figure out some real product market fit. Let's figure out how we can continue to grow when there's a challenge right now is there's just not a lot of new users coming into the space. There's actually the opposite of where there's a lot of users that are leaving the space or just not being as active, basically, as they were before. So I think that it's led you guys to this focus on you know building great apps. So I want to talk about some of the apps that are built on top of DSO. So let's just, you know, there's 2.4 million wallets that have interacted with DSO. Yeah. Uh, how, how many apps are there? We had hundreds at one point. Okay. We have a, a couple dozen now that are actively building, but that's just going back to the mindset and the game that everybody should be playing in crypto right now is trying to build the killer app. Because if you build one killer app, which we proved with BitClout, it can get enough attention to bring more builders and liquidity to the ecosystem. So people will, you know, teams will build other apps, right? Mm-hmm. When the bear market hits, you know, attention goes away, uh, projects get abandoned, everything like that. What we learned at the time was we lacked retention. I think a lot of crypto apps outside mm-hmm. of finance, well, even in finance too, lack retention. There's no reason to stick around if there's no speculative, you know, there's no way to make a bunch of money. You know, mm-hmm. I think you see friend tech, there's a way to make money, there's speculation mm-hmm. and stuff. So people are playing it even in playing that game even in a bear market. So what we set out to do since that point and ever since the bear market hit was, you know, improve and optimize our infrastructure to the point where we've built so many retentive features that when we launch again and we launch our new apps, people will stick around and play around in the ecosystem. Now, going back to some of the apps in the ecosystem, we do have a few dozen really good apps. And I I also like to think we have some, I don't want to bash other chain. I think we have more legit users because it's social. There's a reason to log in every day and post like you would on Twitter versus just logging in and, and voting on a DAO vote or a proposal or trading meme coins or something like that. It's true. Yeah. Social is much more part of a deeper connection in your life. It matters to your day to day. Yeah. Whereas, you know, speculative finance does not matter to your day to day. Exactly. Yeah. It stress you out more. But it doesn't fill your soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It can it definitely doesn't fill your soul. So we do have a few dozen teams still building. We got some cool apps. I'll, uh, I can jump into them if, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Definitely. So we have DSocial World is a pretty cool app. It's DSocialWorld.com. And it's basically like blockchain-based Twitter. And, you know, it converts the network into different languages. So Spanish, Russian, all these different languages. Because decentralized social media is a a worldwide need, right? Mm. And it has like a bunch of different features. Like you can get, instead of just likes and follows, you can get diamonds. You can give people diamond showers. So that's like one of the innovative things where you don't have to wait for a lawn to pay you ad revenue dust. Like people can just pay you up front, you know? tip you directly as a creator and stuff like that. So yeah. I think that's a really cool so, app. Yeah. So, sorry, I just want to understand this this language conversion because this is super interesting. So 
Where is the content from? Is the content from Diamond app? So it all the con. So it's like Deso is the the social layer, right? And then Desocial World, like Diamond, Diamond is a similar app to this Desocial World, right? Diamond's That's, another yeah. app, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's like a node, and like if you post on Desocial World or Diamond. That's how you interact with the content on chain, right? So it's like right. a user interface, right? Right. The cool thing about Deso is if you post on the social world, it shows up on all the apps. And it's amazing. Um, this right? is, like, yeah. Yeah. So imagine like if you were on Twitter and you posted and then you went on YouTube and your posts were there or yeah. you went on LinkedIn or Facebook, you'd only need to build one audience <laughs> one time. And then you could monetize that audience over and over and over again, or you could amplify your engagements instead as a creator. And you know this, Jay, scaling a podcast and stuff like that. You have to learn the algorithm and the dark patterns or whatever for every new platform. And then you have to learn their moderation policies yeah. so you don't get banned or anything like that. Yeah, And it's a grind, man. It, it takes yeah. a lot of energy. It's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so I, I just want to paint a picture for our, our listeners here, because I think this is, we're experiences, experiencing this right now with Paragraph, which is the, our newsletter platform, which is integrated with Farcaster. And whenever somebody posts our newsletter on Farcaster or they comment on our newsletter on Farcaster, it automatically feeds into a comment thread underneath the newsletter. And I think this is why I'm so excited about this interoperable connection of being able to just post once is it's this concept of being able to like one conversation. So yeah. as you said, the most difficult thing right now as a content creator is we have to manage multiple platforms. So this podcast, for example, right? We're going to publish this podcast on all these different podcast platforms. If anybody likes or comments on those podcast platforms, it stays there. This will also be published on YouTube. Yeah. And then we're also going to promote this on Twitter. Well, it's like having like 10 different conversations that are all disconnected. Nobody knows that there's all these different, whereas if we could connect these all in one feed, like it's amazing for content creators, but it's also amazing for people that are learning and using this content and want to have a conversation, want to meet people, want to meet the community and meet others that are involved. Just because maybe you you choose to log in in this way and somebody else logs in from this way, why can't we all connect? Yeah. Plus, Twitter doesn't like you posting links to other platforms. Oh man, they <laughs> hate it. And you have to it drives take me the, insane. The algorithm ding too. And then you have yeah. to find a way around that or pour your content into bite-sized content and then strategically place your link and Oh my God, I can't, like, man, we, every day we have a conversation in our team channel about, don't post that link or, hey, you didn't post a link. How are supposed to be people supposed to know about the next step in joining our community? Well, and then somebody's like, well, if we post the link, we're going to get screwed by the algorithm. Exactly. It sucks. Yeah. So yeah. instead what we do is we have to wait until we hit a certain amount of likes. Basically we post on Twitter. We wait until we hit. 20 likes, and then we auto post the link. Because no way. Screw us. Like, what a stupid game. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. And then you see all the different rules that were invisible to us now that Twitter open sourced the algorithm. Yeah. Imagine all the rules we don't know about on YouTube and Facebook and all and TikTok or whatever else. So it's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Tell, tell us about a few other apps. Oh yeah, so Open Fund. So this is a big one on chain, like capital formation and on on chain fundraising. Brian Armstrong just came out from Coinbase, and he said it's like the number one, number four most important thing mm -hmm. that he wants people to build. Basically, it's just frictionless capital formation and fundraising instead of going the VC route and playing their game. What if you could just raise funds from any cross chain ecosystem and any currency, Solana, Ethereum. Bitcoin, Sui, Deso, all that. What if you could do that? And that's exactly what Open Fund does. And the cool thing about Open Fund, it's it's for anything. So we've had a content creator fund his YouTube channel for like three to five K. We've had this node bits DAO. Basically, it's like a infrastructure to set up nodes. And if you buy the token on 
open fund. They give you yield every month, basically, for owning their token, and they manage all the, their node farm and stuff like that. We had like a AI game that raised money on there. It was like trying to merge AI and social. But it's like if you want to raise a thousand bucks for your project, if you want to raise you know half a million or something, it's just an alternate route of uh, fundraising. So I think I think that this model of decentralized fundraising it's still so new and i love that brian armstrong called it out and any listeners if you guys want to we wrote an article highlighting the 10 things that brian armstrong listed this was a week or two ago so you can go back and check that out on our newsletter on paragraph link is in the show notes but this is why whenever i talk to like my family or people that aren't in crypto i get so excited and i don't know what to talk about because i'm like you don't understand like blockchain is going to change everything. Yeah. It's going to change everything. And so you can go down so many different rabbit holes and open fund is super cool and people should definitely go check it out. We'll throw the link in the show notes, but I feel like there's some ways where we're just not quite ready yet. And this is why I think Brian Armstrong called out what he called out in his 10 things that we should focus on is he's trying to push the areas that are a bit slow right now. Yeah. And that that one is a little bit slow because there's a there's a lot of sort of historic or traditional ways to raise capital and we're kind of stuck in those and i mean no offense but middle finger up to some organizations that are regulating the shit out of us in poor ways and not allowing us and scaring everybody from from innovating so great to see that there is yeah. somebody in the deso ecosystem that's pushing that one so definitely Absolutely. Yeah. Tell, tell us about a few other. Uh... Um, so then we got, we have um, decify.app. It's like the first Web3 social app in the App Store. So you could download decify, okay. interact with the DSO blockchain, and experience on chain social. You still own your content and social graph. It's kind of a stripped down version. Because... So it's a mobile app in yeah. the App Store, which, as we all know, the App Store does not allow crypto NFTs. Yeah. Well, kind of does in any how did they get around this you tell us how they got around this so unfortunately your DSO identity and content and stuff is still stored on the DSO blockchain you just don't have the monetization features not to say that you can still post on DSOfy and people can tip you and you can make money but you don't have those features on the app so it's just like it's like having a web3 version of twitter on your phone where people can still pay you, but you can't really do anything with the money unless you right. go to the desktop. Because that's that's the issue that the App Store presents is yeah. they'll let you do any sales of anything in the app, but the rule is they take a 30% tax and yeah. nobody in crypto wants to pay that. And I, I got to say, respect, because the easy way to get around this is you could just be like, fine, we'll pay the 30% tax, but yeah. everybody in crypto is so anti the old establishment and that's amazing when we all stand together in that way yeah i mean look at crypto's history we've literally bootstrapped an entire financial system yeah. with people like throwing constant hurdles in our face and regulatory fear and stuff like that to a trillion and at one point three trillion dollar market cap so we're used to like pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps you know i love it, I love yeah. it. okay one more yeah. to Hero Swap. You had mentioned that before we started recording. Yeah. This is an interesting one. So it's a cross chain, it's instant anonymous cross chain swapper. Like I said, we're UX maxis. We're trying to make it easy. And part of our strategy is building cross chain. So Hero Swap, you can embed in any crypto app on any chain that it supports. So it supports Solana, Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, SUI. Ava, Avalanche, a USDT, and USDC. And the cool thing about that is there are apps on Solana and SUI using it. So, for example, hyperspace.xyz embedded it into their NFT marketplace, and it allows Ethereum holders to buy Solana NFTs. So if you're holding Bitcoin, Ethereum, SUI, DSO, you can buy Solana NFTs versus having to go through a centralized exchange, log in, transfer your money, and stuff like that. Now with Hero Swap, it's just like one, basically one or two clicks, and you can engage in that NFT market. The other cool thing is the leading SUI wallet, Ethos wallet, embedded Hero Swap. So it's like if you want to try some SUI app, I know they do a lot of games. So if you want to play a game, 
you can instantly swap into SUI and then engage in that game versus again, like all those different steps where you have to transfer money. It's just one click. You got SUI in your wallet, you can play that game. Amazing. That is, I mean, so, so essential for users to actually be able to engage yeah. in Web3 is we need these. And we need the way to operate cross-chain because yeah. one thing that I, I just want, I always want to repeat it again and again is like, there's so much tribalism from the chain level, you know, like everybody's like, oh, I'm an ETH maxi or I'm a yeah. Bitcoin maxi or I'm a Solana maxi. And it's like, yo, drop it. A, a that is the opposite of innovation, right? Yeah. We all need to support each other. And B, there is literally so much open space. Like there is enough open space for all of us to win, for all chains to exist, for them all to serve a purpose. And they all can work with much better UX because of things like account extraction and hero swap and these that will make it much easier to, you won't have to think about, there will be the day when you don't have to think like, yeah. oh, do I have the token in my wallet that I need to go do this thing? Oh, wait, I don't. Okay, I gotta go. Like, no, that's just, I mean, we've so many times on Web3 Academy, we did a uh, a free mint when we launched our new brand about a month ago and yeah. uh, we did it on Zora. Because uh, Zora is just a great simple app to yeah. uh, mint open editions, but we did it on Zora Chain. When you do, when you launch something on Zora, you can pick the chain you want to do it on. And we didn't pick ETH because we knew if we picked ETH, it would cost. You know, it's a free mint, but it would right. the gas would have been like five dollars, and then it's not a free mint anymore. Right. So we did Zora Chain. It still costs like cents, but anyways. Right. Uh, but the problem is, you need Zora in your wallet, and nobody's got Zora in their wallet, so. Yeah. We lost, you know, how many people didn't mint that, right? Because yeah. the UX was so shit. Like, it, it sucks, yeah. And that's that's what Hero Swap solves. Like, you might not have it in your wallet, but you can swap right into it. You know, yeah. No login, instantly in an honest me, anonymous. But yeah, I think like someday people aren't going to matter. The chain's not going to matter. It's like you think about the like video game wars. You know, mm -hmm. like Nintendo had the big lead. Right. Then PlayStation and Xbox came around. Right. There were diehard Nintendo people, but people bought PlayStation and Xbox because they wanted to play that game. They didn't care if, you know, it, it was a fun game. That's the phase we're entering now with crypto is the killer app phase. Whoever builds the killer apps that scale, they're going to get all the attention and everything. And that's the game we're playing at DSO. Yeah. That's what we're building. And, and you, know what, you know what I love about this point is what that means is the chains that will i'm going to say win in terms of will receive the most activity are the chains that have the biggest apps built on top of them so not necessarily the chains that you know you're a maxi about not necessarily the chain with the best tech right like right. there's a reason I, I i'm not going to I don't say this to slam on Polygon at all. I think Polygon's great, but there is a reason that Polygon has gotten as big as they have, where they're, I think, the, the fifth chain by market cap. I can't remember, yeah. but they're, they're up there. And the reason is because they have such a good business development team that they got Starbucks, they got Reddit, they got Nike, they got all of these large brands to build on top of their chain. And so it shows that, yeah, it's, it's the apps that make the difference. Frentech, same thing. Everyone's so stoked about Base. Well, one of the reasons that Base has been so successful is because Frentech, the hottest app right now, was built on top of Base. So, right. and I think there's going to be great apps. I think, oh, I always say, you know, there's going to be probably thousands, uh, probably millions of apps that are built on chain that are successful. I mean, right now, I think there's over 2 million apps in the App Store right now. Those are built online. Well, why wouldn't there be 2 million built on chain? One thing I, want, I just want to highlight quickly is the way the DSO ecosystem works, because I know some of these apps are built by you and your core team, yeah. uh, and then others are built by outside teams. How does funding work? If somebody has an app idea, how do they get involved? Yeah, that's a really good idea. So in the early days, we, we did fund several different apps that are still building in the ecosystem. Some of them are, some of them are. It's part of the bear market, but we did fund some early apps uh, like NFT Marketplace, DSocial World is one we funded as well. And then basically 
a lot of the apps that we create are basically problems we run into to solve UX issues. Like that's how we built Hero Swap. That's essentially what we built with Open Fund. We were planning ahead. So mm-hmm. once we build a few killer apps and the attention and liquidity comes back, it's going to draw in more builders. They can go to Open Fund and raise funds. As far as fundraising right now and, and grants and stuff like that, we pause that. But anybody yeah. who's interested in building on DSO should definitely reach out to us for sure because there you know, could come a point in time in the near future that we're going to open funding back up. And mm-hmm. plus, we got tons of VC and investor connections. So if we don't fund you directly and you have an awesome app idea and you want to follow it through Open Fund, we'll connect you with investors for sure. So- All right. So- uh- Ash, what's your Twitter? Where it's, can people uh, hang you up? Yeah, at invest in digital. Yeah. <laughs> digital, so. Okay. Is that actually your Twitter? Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't know that. I feel like because I've been checking out your stuff on DSO on Diamond, I know your handle there. Yeah. Your so, Twitter is invest in digital. That's amazing. I was just like, I don't care about stocks or anything. I'm only going to invest in digital things. That's, okay. And I was like, invest in digital. So Okay. Cool. Cool. I love it. Uh, Okay. We've talked a little bit about the swings of building in crypto, building on chain really is a result of the market swings. You know, unfortunately, I wouldn't say this is unfortunate, but one of the tough things that I think everybody in crypto knows, whether you're a builder, whether you're an investor, is that you are tied to the market swings and markets swing big in crypto up 500x up a thousand x and then down right like that's something that obviously affects teams what are the challenges that you guys face how do you decide i know you've you know you've you've got sort of deso the next stage of deso coming up soon and i want to talk about what's involved in that but before we do just what are the challenges that you guys sort of are focused on fixing or facing every day yeah. So, I mean, liquidity is number one, yeah. um, obviously. I think everybody's dealing with that, but combating network effects of not only uh, you know other layer ones like Ethereum or Solana, but also of social networks like Twitter, right? So they have a 20-year head start on building habit-forming kind of like UIs and stuff like that. Like people are used to logging into Twitter every single day to post. It's very, very easy. You don't think about it. It goes back to don't make me think. Beating those network effects and then building retention so people stick around is very, very difficult to do. It's one of the biggest challenges. And we do have like kind of like a small diehard community that's building on chain. There's some that post every single day. Some of them come back every few months and, you know, see what's going on and stuff. But um, the way you solve that, and again, I'm I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's all about building UX, better user experiences and better retention to kind of beat down those network effects. Mm -hmm. And then once we get our chain optimized and we have these other releases coming up, it it turns into innovation. How are we going to build the next innovative social network that has features that aren't out there yet, right? And that's how we beat the network effects is we have to build something that no one's seen before and the UX has to be so good that they don't have to worry about signing a transaction or you know paying too much money or losing or bridging or anything like that. You guys have been heads down building through the bear. Respect yeah. to you and your team. Uh, I know you guys are a small but mighty team uh, and there's some big launches coming out in the next few months. Can you give us sort of uh, what are the top big launches that you guys have coming in the next month? And let's dive into each of them. Yeah. So our biggest one that's coming just around the corner is Revolution Proof of Stake. So believe it or not, we're still a proof of work blockchain because mm. Natter is a huge Bitcoin like maxi. He loves Bitcoin. So believe it or not, DSO was inspired by Bitcoin. So that's why we went proof of work originally. But we're moving to proof of stake, which is... Mm-hmm going to introduce all sorts of like fun, new, innovative features with mm-hmm. making DSO. And one of the coolest ones we can kind of start talking about right now is 
staking and to get your yield, you have to post regularly. So that solves the retention issue. So, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. I s- walk me through this. So imagine that Revolution Proof of Stake is live and we launched one of our new apps and you stake your DSO, right? And then if you wanted to get your yield, uh, you had to log in once a day, you know, for X amount of days and you had to post or do some sort of social action to get your yield. And otherwise, if you didn't post, then you would lose it or you wouldn't get your yield that round. And that's kind of what we're building right now. So I love that. Yeah, it's an early concept. So I don't have all the details just yet, but that is something we're definitely working on. And I think we'll solve retention in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it makes a nice connection between, you know, staking is just like an incredible mechanism that I I think is as such a foundational concept that all businesses can use in really unique ways that we haven't even I think most people think about just, you know, stake in order to get a APR, you know, three percent, four percent. Most people I hope that are listening to this podcast are staking ETH. If you're not staking ETH, go start staking some ETH. Don't stake all your ETH, but stake some of it because it's just the obvious thing to do. But this idea of staking and then also posting or taking an activity, doing something on chain or in an app, and I think it's possible with innovation that you know somebody could say, maybe you stake and you like like something 10 times, well, then you get yield. It's just another mechanism for rewarding people who take action in your ecosystem. I I love that. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be an exciting feature. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But yeah, I mean, Revolution Proof of Stake is going to make DSO faster, arguably a little bit cheaper too. It's going to be actually make the chain smoother, more stable things are going to feel even more instant than they already are. But yeah, that's one of the innovative, cool, innovative new features that could come. When, from when, what's the timeline for revolution proof of stake? So it should be up on testnet in the next couple months. And then we're aiming for live by the end of the year. So cool. fully live. So we're going to test it, make sure everything is super smooth and then we're going to go live for it. So yeah. well, good luck to you and your team. I think that people don't understand the challenges of moving a chain from proof of work to proof of stake. We've just seen it a few times now that everyone's just like, oh yeah, no problem. Like everybody can do that. It's like, no, no, the engineering that goes into this is massive. So shout out to your engineering team. Well, man, yeah, for sure. Okay. What are the other focuses of the upcoming launches? So we've talked about this a bunch, uh, at least I've hinted at it is, focusing on infrastructure, basically to pave the way to play the killer app game. And then we have basically, we want to launch up to five killer apps. We have three proposals right now. If you go to proposals.deso.com, that's where you can kind of see the app. And are they they proposed by your team or external teams? They're going to be us first. So basically it's kind of like going back to the video game analogy. It's like Nintendo's notorious for launching, creating their own games first. Mm -hmm. And then the community kind of makes it. So first party games versus third party games, right? So we just launched, like imagine we launched all this new technology and how are we going to inspire people to build their own killer apps, right? We have to drink our own Kool-Aid, build the killer apps ourselves, show you exactly how to build them, and then hopefully get attention and other teams on the platform. So these are all first party apps we're going to build ourselves. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I really like that analogy of the gaming console because it shows you that really what you need to make it in, I mean, not just in crypto and blockchain, but like to make it in any technology is. Yeah, sure, you can have great infrastructure, but you need a killer app. And we're sort of at that point. You guys are clearly at that point. It feels like the whole of crypto, blockchain, Web3, the whole space is at that point where everyone's like, hey, we're finally ready for like mass consumer apps because we weren't really ready for it before. And I just feel like, man, there's going to be a collision, I think, of 
the bull market is going to come back, whether it comes back in three months, whether it comes back in 12 months, I don't know. I'm not going to go and make a prediction like that on air and then somebody's going to come back and bite me, but it's going to come. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And I think that there's an opportunity coming if you collide that and you have that killer app combined with the bull market, which is going to bring a whole bunch of people on chain, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of reward to be had. So excited for the timing of that from you guys. Yeah. And this playbook is, it's not completely unique. It's happened on Ethereum several times. The killer apps on Ethereum were ICOs. I know people say ICOs were a scam, but it captured attention. Yeah. It brought liquidity to Ethereum. Then people had to build apps to manage that liquidity. Then it happened with DeFi. You've had that loop going. Then it happened with NFTs, right? DSO is just doing it with consumer facing apps. It's, yeah. it's not, yeah. So it's a playbook that's worked many times before. Cool. Yeah. I know one other thing you guys are launching is a new Block Explorer, which Block Explorers are fascinating. We actually did an episode with Seb, the founder of Zapper, who is building a Block Explorer on top of Ethereum. And I think this, it's tough to sort of wrap your head around Block Explorers because there is no Web2 equivalent of a Block Explorer. Yeah. And I think the only current, most of us think Block Explorer, we think Etherscan, which if you've ever gone and looked at Etherscan, uh, good luck. Like unless you're like a, a real blockchain nerd, right? That like understands how to navigate Etherscan. Most people, myself included, look at Etherscan. I'm like, what, you know, like numbers, what is this, right? Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the Block Explorer that you guys are planning and how it's different than maybe Etherscan and what it will allow you to do? Yeah. So to put it simply, we're building a human readable Block Explorer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So in the Block Explorer, to understand the impact, you got to kind of understand Web2 social media, which is a closed off ecosystem, a walled garden where they monopolize all our data. What if there was a social network, which there is like DSO, that was completely open source where everybody could look and see what's happening on chain or on. And what if you could peek behind Zuckerberg's server farm and see like what he's doing with our data? You know, that's essentially what we're building with DSO and the Block Explorer, you can interact with the DSO block chain and see exactly what's going on. You can see all the interactions. And one thing I always point to is I think there's more scams in Web2 social media than there are in Web3 social media. You just can't see the scams. So they'll always point their finger at crypto and be like, oh yeah, you rug this, rug that. But we don't know all the bot stuff that's going on in Web2. We just see the outside of it and they hide it. They're always using misdirection and stuff like that. So imagine the block explorer, we could look into Twitter and uh, that's kind of what we're building with, with the DSO block explorer. So a hot take, there's more scams in web two than there are in web three. Uh, Val clip that we need to push that message more yeah. because from the outside, thanks to uh, our friend, Sam Bankman fried and a few others, we look like the ones that are building scams. Yeah, one two, but it's so true. Well, I I don't remember what the number was, but didn't the when Elon initially made the offer to buy Twitter, he almost reneged on the offer because he when he got the numbers and was allowed to look, wasn't it something like I don't remember, I don't want to mis misquote this, but it was like a large percentage of Twitter users were bots. And yeah. he basically said that they were not worth what they said they were worth because such a, it was something like 30%. Yeah, it's crazy. I might be wrong, but it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was that high. Honestly, I don't think you were that far off, but yeah, you didn't want to buy it because there are so many, there were so many bots. I don't know. And I think there's still bots, you know, it's like yeah. you see all these uh, accounts that have like a hundred thousand followers and like 36 likes what's going on there. So, well, and that's another thing that decentralized social can solve because I mean a few ways a with on-chain identity which we we're not really diving into in this episode but that is part of it but also there's this potential innovation I don't know if anybody in the DSO ecosystem is doing this but there's a lot of people talking about how you know the current way so Twitter solves that apparently by you have to pay eight dollars a month right or a thousand dollars a month at your enterprise you have to pay this fee 
to get the blue check mark and then it's like, yeah. well, I'm official. Well, even a bot can pay a fee, right? right? But if if you had to pay a very small fee to interact or to use it, well, then you can't have scalable bots, right? So like I saw one person talk about how the solution or email spam was, well, let's just make it so it costs one cent basically to send every email. And yeah. then all of a sudden, bots don't work anymore because bots don't work if there's one bot. A bot is right. a good business. I hate to call bots a business, but it's right. only a business if you can manage millions of them and then get conversions. So there's interesting things that could happen there as well as a result of blockchain, which are possible. Yeah, that's the thing is like with our block explorer, you could go on chain and see who's scamming people or not scamming right. people because your reputation's fully on chain, your identity's on yeah. chain. And you can see that on the block explorer. You can't see that on Twitter. You, there's no way to tell. Well, we need Zach XBT and like these these investigative, basically block explorer investigators yeah. who are going and doing this research. Well, imagine we didn't need that. Imagine we didn't need him. We right. could just find that ourselves super easily. Wouldn't that be a safer world? Or what if there was a community of Zach XBTs? Maybe there's like 30 of them, you right. know, that were like teamed up together and, yeah. you know. We do actually have an account on DSO called like, I think it's DSO scams or something in there. They're a community that calls out any sort of scams on chain. So that's like kind of forming up on a small scale on DSO right now. It's, it's so interesting working with internet strangers yeah. that can happen as a result of basically tokens and this token economy you could have communities in the past and we've had communities forever, but there could, it was really in the web too, or the, the old world to call it that seems a bit ridiculous and a better term right now popping into my head, but it's really hard to work with a bunch of strangers. If you want to involve money, you can do it if you don't want to involve money, but let's be real. We all need to make money. Most of us, when we put in effort, we like to receive monetary gain in return as we should for our time. Well, now there's there's these ways that are so fascinating where you can have a DSO scams community where they can put out content and now maybe a whole bunch of people start tipping them because they're like, wow, I really like this content. This is helping me. I value this. And now they have some money flowing in and they can distribute that on chain very easily for anybody who contributes. They could even create a leaderboard where you get distributed based upon how much you contribute to that community. I mean, it's just, there's yeah. so much. Yeah, it's mind blowing. I mean, that's the thing. That's why DSO's here is like, we're unlocking innovation in social media. Yeah, we're creating a social layer for crypto and Web3, but we're like, the subtle differences is bringing innovation back to social media at scale. So I think you just came up with the title for today's show, Unlocking Innovation in Social Media. Uh, I was still going to go with the uh, the social layer of crypto, but you, you nailed it there, Ash. Well, well done. Happy okay. to <laughs> Before we jump into a speed round, a couple personal questions. I, I want to give the floor to you to shill. People listening, if they want, I mean, you already mentioned your Twitter, but if they want to get in touch with you or if they want to learn more about Decel, how do they go about that? Yeah, a couple things I wanted to highlight is like we're doing a lot of innovative stuff, not only in crypto, but in social media. So, like, if you go to DSO apps right now, Diamond app or DSocial World, you can directly monetize, you know, on chain without having to go viral. We have creators on the platform already making thousands of bucks over, you know, the last year or two just posting and they don't have that many followers. They might have like five, 10, 15,000 followers. So you don't have to necessarily play that super grindy game on Web2 social media. So if you want to, you know, try DSO apps, go to Diamond app. That's a good starter app. If you want to find us on Twitter, Web2 social media, DSO protocol at DSO protocol, you can reach out to, uh, directly to me at Invest in Digital on Twitter as well. And yeah, I think FriendTech is essentially a fork of our first prototype app, BitCloud. You know, we've had these features for a couple of years. So yeah, so I would love to see more people on chain trying our apps and everything. Yeah, we we didn't even talk about that. We actually, when, when Frontech first came out, yeah, uh, and we did an episode about it. We talked about how it was basically just BitCloud, yeah, uh, but it was yeah. BitCloud of the moment. It is so interesting how similar it is, and 
BitClout had its day, did really well, but was not a long-term sustainable business. And for everybody on Frentech, neither is Frentech in its current form. It doesn't right. mean, look, I'm not saying that Frentech can't make, make it. They've already made over seven and a half million dollars just off of fees for activity on Frentech. Plus they've raised from Paradigm. So like similar to you guys, well-funded and in a good position to build something. But those apps in their current form where you're basically just speculating on your friend and there's a benefit to more people jumping in and speculating and it just drives up prices, like that's not long-term sustainable business. It's kind of like bull market vibes, which is funny because it's bear market right now, but it's like the only thing that's getting the vibes right now because there's just not a lot of liquidity and it's all gone in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. There's no retention yet. No. There could be. They could build it. It's that's the thing. The first, that's yeah, it's the first killer app on base. Let's just, you know, that's yeah. what it is. Well said. Yeah. 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 Well said. Okay. Well, look forward to seeing the next killer app on DSO when you guys launch your five killer apps in the coming months. All the links that you mentioned will be in the show notes. So anybody who wants to go check out Diamond or any of the other apps that we mentioned, those will be in the show notes. So make sure you check those out. Okay. Quick speed round before we wrap here. Ash. Favorite person to follow on Twitter? And maybe I should ask your favorite person to follow on DSO, but commonly this question is on Twitter. Yeah. So Ryan Selkis of Masari, you know, I really love his posts and he really, he shoots it straight with people. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't really BS that much. So he's definitely my favorite follow. I have a lot of respect for him as well. So yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. These straight shooter is well said. That guy does not mess yeah, around. No. Okay. A must read book. So Reframe Your Brain by Scott Adams. This book, I just started reading it. I was gonna say how to win friends and influence people. That's a classic, but Reframe Your Brain is it's like mind blowing. It just like teaches you like how to look at reality in a different way, to spin it in a positive light. And he breaks down all these different examples of everyday interactions with people and it definitely helps man you know it's cool. like it it's easy to get negative in the bear market so i think i needed this one so totally totally yeah i mean it's easy to get negative at any time negativity is a stronger feeling than positivity unfortunately right. uh, you know guilt and shame which we all feel a lot of guilt and shame in these bear markets when we had so much wealth at one point and now we don't. And we're all like, oh, I should have sold it. I should have done this. That's heavy shit. And that can Big weigh time. on you. Big time. Yeah. Cool. Good. That's, good. Yeah. And that's what, oh, if you're struggling with that, read that book for sure. Yeah. Man, I, I, I'm struggling. I'm going to check that book out for sure. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Our favorite question on the show. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? Not your keys, not your content. So, okay. Yeah. If you're posting on web two social media platforms, you're just renting space. You don't own your keys. You don't own your content. You don't have any right over your content. I like what Alon's doing, but ultimately mm -hmm. he owns your content. It's in his server farms, but web three, social media, crypto, social media, social fi, whatever you want to call it. You own your keys, you own your content, you own your assets. You can monetize it however you want. I love it. I, I always go, not your keys, not your coins. But yeah. you know what? There's another line. A lot of people aren't going to come into crypto for the money. So they're not going to care about not your keys, not your coin. A lot of people are going to come in for better social media and yep. they're going to care to own their content. So that's a good one. Awesome. Yeah. I love that one. Ash, this has been a pleasure, man. Really appreciate the time. Really appreciate your insights. Just incredible to speak to somebody who's so deep building in the space and really excited to watch the future of DSO. You guys have got exciting things ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on, allowing me to shill DSO, talk social media. I love talking about this stuff. So even you know off the podcast, I'd love to chat more, but I, I really do appreciate you letting us amplify DSO. No, for sure, man. You guys are doing a great job. Respect to the whole team at DSO. High fives all around. I was going to say all around the office, but I'm yeah. sure you guys aren't. <laughs> In an office, Definitely I don't think not. any crypto team, other than maybe Coinbase, I'm sure has an office, but the rest right. of us are all remote. So shout out. We'll have to get you guys back on in yeah. the next maybe six to 12 months after 
you've done, gone through this big launch that you have coming up that maybe in a bit of a bull market. We'll, yeah. we'll check in on numbers again. Until then, yeah, wish you guys all the best. Everybody for listening in. Thanks so much. Make sure, yeah, remember, not your keys, not your content. If you're not on some form of decentralized social, you should be on it. Definitely go check out DSO and get involved. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.